Hi, everybody. We are recording. Um, this is David P. France coming to you from Basel, Switzerland. And uh, before we get started with the interview, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to like the video, share the video, and subscribe to the channel, David P. France TV. Uh, and today, I'm speaking with Matt Robinson, who is the author of a I would say a, a uh, self-published book, self-published book, Lions, Tigers, and Bulldogs. And this is an unofficial guide to the legends and lore of the Ivy League. Welcome, Matt. How are you? Great, David. Great to be with you. Thanks for calling. I'm, I'm great, great to be with you, too. And you're, you're currently in Boston, is that correct? Yeah, just west of Boston. But just Boston. west of Boston. Yeah. Well, it's great to talk to you. You and I have been emailing back and forth for a while. And um, uh, when you told me that what you had uh, you, you, what you had authored, what you had written, I said, "Well, can, yeah, let's do it." All right. And just so you know, again, uh, Matt is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, so um, I'm going to put that not a disclaimer, but a <laughs> point of pride. <laughs> point of pride. And look, you know, a lot of people might be asking me. Well, Dave, you have a lot of people from Penn. Well, I do know a lot of people from Penn, right? I mean, I, I spend a lot of time there as a big community um, of mine. And so, you know, um, as we are figuring out creative ways to uh, get information out to people during this challenging time, um, the Penn alums are the people that I'm calling on um, quite often. So tell yeah, us so about... Tell us about the book, right? I mean, um, I'm interested in, in what you have uh, discovered. Tell us what you know about the book, why you wrote the book. Okay. Well, the, the basic story is that my, my father had, had gone to Brown. And when I was young, I used to go to the Brown football games uh, in Providence every other year. Like usually Brown, Harvard, he had some friends up here in Boston from Harvard. So we'd go down to Providence and watch the game. and as any Ivy uh, alums or fans know, sometimes the football isn't all that much to watch. So I kind of fell in love with the mascot. There was this guy or girl, I don't know, in a bear suit with a big head on and just completely wild and uninhibited and having a blast. And it got to the point where people said, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, little boy? And I said, I want to be the brown bear. I just totally fell in love with the idea. And it stuck with me. So I kind of got into mascots, not like you know, I, I never I never was one. My high school didn't have one. My grade school didn't really have one. But I just, um, people would name a school and I could name the mascot. It just got to be sort of a, a thing that I would pick up on. And um, so I went, I ended way led on to way. I thought I was going to go to Brown. I ended up going to Penn. Not, not a bad second choice. Um, and Penn, we had the Quaker, but they didn't have the big head. It was a per at that time, it was a person you could see who they were. So they seemed to be a little more toned down. Uh, there was more of a, like a head cheerleader than a mascot. There wasn't that separation. But it was still a lot of fun. I was in the band. I used to write the halftime shows and got to write all the dirty jokes about the other schools and things like that. But I still love the mascot thing. And after I graduated from Penn, I was an English major. I had so many inspirational uh, English and writing teachers there. And I became a writer. And I've been a writer for 25 years. Um, I've done mostly journalism. Uh, I've done some public relations writing, some development marketing writing. Mm -hmm. um, and people would always ask me, when, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? And I had ideas, you know, on my computer, including one about mascots. But it just, it just seemed to be like it wasn't the right time. It, you know, it was going to be a lot of work, a lot of expense without a guarantee of return. And when I had paid gigs coming in, it was hard to justify doing something for myself, no matter mm -hmm. how much it was calling me. Uh, unfortunately, about 10 years ago, my father was diagnosed with dementia, and that really put things in a new perspective. I mean, being a writer, if I was going to have trouble with vocabulary and mental facility, you know, I needed to kind of pick up the pace on any projects I wanted to get done. So in his honor and now in his memory, I, I wrote the book, and um, the research was a blast. I have so much extra material. People are asking me for a volume two already, but it took a long time to get it done. Um, I had a publisher who had specialized in working with colleges, but in the end didn't seem to really know the ins and outs of the Ivy League. It was sort of, they did mostly the, the larger, the big, big 10, Pac-12, mm -hmm. things like that. 
So we were going on and moving along and it seemed to be going great, it seemed to be a perfect marriage. But then, uh, like I said, they were having trouble connecting to the people that I needed to connect to. I was actually having more success on my own. So uh, we decided to part ways and I ended up self-publishing, uh, which was, you know, a, a trial uh, in, it, on its own. It was, it's, it's been challenging, but I found a great illustrator, Jim Rolden. He's a uh, art teacher in Maine, in New Hampshire, sorry. And we, we've been working really well together. He's done great work. Uh, he designed the whole book with me, really got what I wanted out of it. And, uh, you know, it, there was some expense involved, but I've been slowly making it up and uh, meeting a lot of great alumni at all of the schools mm -hmm. and, you know, making connections like this one. So it's really been worthwhile. Um, and when that first box came, I, I remember opening the box and seeing the book and my name in print. And I actually wrapped the first copy and uh, sealed it in plastic. Mm -hmm. And I brought it up to, uh, to my father's cemetery and I kind of presented it to him. And that was a really kind of emotional, meaningful day. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it was a, it was a hard process, um, but it was really rewarding. The relationships I, I made, the, the things I've learned about these schools and the things I learned about myself as, as a writer uh, were really, really productive. And it's really kind of uh, got me thinking that, you know, maybe maybe another book wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be such a such a um, wouldn't be something to put off for as long as I put this mm -hmm. one off. Well, well, I have a couple of questions. So, your father went to Brown. Yeah. Didn't we talk about some other family members? Do you have other family members that attended Penn or Brown or other other? My my wife's my wife's the greenie from Dartmouth. Uh, her mother went to Barnard in Columbia. Uh, so yeah, there, there's there's a, there's a lot of uh, one of her father's cousins is a professor at Harvard Business School. There, there's you know it's in the right. water. Yeah, right. it's in the water. <laughs> and, and, and for people who are not based in the United States or people who don't know, can you tell people what the Ivy League is about and why it's meaningful? Like, do you have that information? Well, ba basically, the, from the research I conducted, um, it, was, it started off, um, you know, these are some of the oldest schools in the country, seven of the eight schools that are considered the Ivy League, which are Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, Penn, Princeton, and Yale, all except Cornell were created before the American Revolution. So they're, okay. they're definitely some of the oldest schools uh, in the country. Um, and the, the thing that makes them different is according to an agreement that they all made uh, in the creation of an athletics division in the middle of the 20th century, uh, th they don't give athletic scholarships. They, 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 they try to focus on academics and prioritize academics, even for their student athletes. And they've had some amazing student athletes. Uh, Sandy Koufax went to Columbia, Ed Marinaro, the football player who was on Hill Street Blues, if anyone remembers that great yes. show, he went to Cornell. Yeah. You know, so there, there's a lot of great um, athletic history, academic history, world leaders, you know, a lot of presidents went to these schools. Um, a lot of CEOs of, of, of the biggest companies in the world went, or at least attended, if not graduated. Um, so I found a really, a lot of amazing, rich and often humorous history, you know, like the chicken nugget was invented at Cornell. I would not have, you know, would not have put that together, but there it is. Um, so it's those schools that are these uh -huh. historic schools that, um, prioritize academics over athletics. They do not, they, according to their charters, they do not, uh, if you're a good athlete, that does not come to be considered in your application. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, um, and they're usually, you know, on the smaller side, uh, they're, they're not like the big state, state schools like a Michigan or a USC. Uh, they're usually, you know, anywhere from like five to 20,000 students, which is, you know, still relative, bigger than small liberal arts colleges like we have around my area, but, um, and obviously elsewhere in the world. But, um, and that, hold, that's on, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Okay. I just <laughs> Because I'm having technical, I'm having some technical, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Are you there? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so I'm sorry. You, so you, um, the last statement that you said uh, before you were interrupted. I'm sorry. No, I mean, they, the, the the basic difference is that uh, they they fo they focus on on academics, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, and as a result. Uh, a lot of world-changing, world-leading people have, have emerged from, from these schools, and they have a very fine reputation. 
Uh, it, it's a real goal for many students to even be accepted in, into any one of the eight. Um, of course, you know, being in, living in Massachusetts, Harvard has always been a presence around here uh, mm -hmm. in our financial market, in our uh, medical and technological advances. So it, it, you know, it's kind of, and my father going to Brown it was kind of a world that I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of other a lot of other people may not be, but hopefully, you know, a lot of people read the book said, you know, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know this, and mm -hmm. uh, some some schools have been picking up copies to put in their libraries to uh, have their college counselors show students who are thinking about these schools. Mm -hmm. It's not. It is not a guide on how to get into these schools. Right, Actually, sure, I, of I'm, course, I'm, right, right. right. Yeah, but there's I'm a big sure market. There's a big market for. There's a huge market to get in, right? As we know, and it has, there has been a big market for a long time, right? Um, the other question I have is, let's say, I mean, before we get to the book, and you have it right behind you. So when the box came in the mail, right? When you had the box come in the mail, um, how many? generally come when you're self-publishing how many do you come that come come in a box or, or like how many did you order I, I, or I ordered, I ordered a, an initial box of, of, of 50 uh, because I, I had already scheduled some events at local bookstores mm -hmm. and, and schools where I was going to be presenting the book and, and selling them from you know on my own from a table right. so I, I, I want I want to have a good amount um, you know now it's available on the website, lionstigersbulldogs.com. Right. I'm going to be moving it to Amazon in August uh, just uh, to make things easier for people to find it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason I started with my own website and not on Amazon is a lot of the independent bookstores obviously are being hurt by Amazon. And they basically told me, if you're working with Amazon, you know, you won't work with us. And I've always been a champion of the entrepreneur and the independent. I do a lot of my writing has been uh, mm -hmm. about and for uh, small organizations. So I really wanted to give a full year uh, to, to you know, pursuing those, those avenues. Uh, but the issue has been ease of access to the book. A lot of people, um, some of the self-publishers, they're, they're, one of the things they fall down on is it takes a long time for them to ship for some reason. Right. And uh, so a lot of people who have ordered the book told me, you know, it's been a long time. Where is it? And they get frustrated. <laughs> right. uh, they want to give it as a gift or something, and it's not going to come on time. So um, I've had people emailing me, and I've just been mailing it, mailing copies to them. Uh, but hopefully, having it on Amazon will uh, will make it a little easier for people to access. So that mm -hmm. that should be coming in August. All right. So and and when was the the timing of the publishing? Because um, not the publishing, but um, you and I talked about right around the time when all of these things started happening in the world. That's when you 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 had published the the book self-published a couple months before is that right yeah the, the book the, my my deadline was um my father would have been 80 in mm -hmm. august of 2019 so that that was my deadline like i said i wanted to be able to present it to him as it were on mm -hmm. his 80th birthday so that that was the deadline so it came out in like the first week of i got the i got my my box of 50 on the first week of august of, mm -hmm. of last year so that's that that's that's and i've just been you know i've been presenting it at bookstores and schools and uh, office, you know, just basically, you know, and anyway, I had a, a little shop in Harvard Square that they let me, a little storefront I had for a day where I was presenting the book. Right. I do a presentation of Ivy related trivia called Trip T R I V Y A, which I've been doing online and live. Um, and then I also have a presentation, which I've kind of been summarizing here about what is, what is, what it's been like to be a self published author, where I go a little more into the details. Okay. Uh, and I've been presenting, presenting that around town just to different writing groups and things like that. Well, I mean, let, let's talk about what's behind. You have a couple of things in addition to the, the book there. Well, this, this, this is just, you know, this is my, this is my office, uh, my office bookshelves, but I just thought to be uh, funny, I'd make uh, just little references to the schools. So there's Harvard Ale, Penn Quaker Oats, the Brown Bear, um, MGM Lion is actually the lion from Columbia University. They borrowed the mascot. Uh, because uh, uh, one of the Goldman brothers was actually at Columbia. Right. Uh, Frosted, Frosted Flakes is your Princeton Tiger. You know, being a Penn guy, we always have a little poke, a little fun at the Princeton guys. There's your, uh, there's a handsome Dan the Twelfth, your your Yale Bulldog, and uh, and you know the the, the Dartmouth Green and and the Crimson Big Red. You know, uh -huh. the thing the thing that surprised me is that with, as old as these schools are, three of them are named after colors. You think they'd be able to come up with something a little more? You know, it's not like they were running out of ideas in the uh -huh. six in 1636 but there you know crimson is officially red i mean cornell is officially the big red dartmouth is the big green and harvard is the crimson so you know and then of course 
you have the bears, the tigers. I mean, there, there's not a lot of uh, originality here. <laughs> which well, I mean, in terms me. of products, I mean, are there, are there actual ties to the different products and the films? Like, I mean, we, you talked about MGM, they borrowed it. Yeah. I mean, well, there are MGM, stories behind each one of them. MGM is a real tie. Um, you know, this is supposed to be a variation of William Penn, who didn't found Penn, but, you know, was the, the owner, the, the founder, the governor of, of, the, of Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. Harvard Ale, there's, actually, there's actually a town called Harvard, Massachusetts, which is not near Harvard University. Well, it's sort mm -hmm. of near, but it, it's a separate town and, and they had a brewery. So, you know, same family name, obviously yeah. the name recognition. There, you know, there's a, there's a Harvard bartending court. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I went to Harvard. The bartending uh -huh. course, you know, uh -huh. so that, that there's a there's a lot of uh, that name is pretty pretty prominent around. Here. Uh huh. Uh huh. And um, is there anything in the book, or are they some other information that you can give us without giving away the whole book? <laughs> All right, like maybe three items. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, for me, the easiest ones to come up with were, were Penn and Brown because I'd had the most exposure. But uh -huh. uh, I, I I learned I learned so much. Um, yeah, you know, I, I didn't know that Brown had originally been the Burroughs. Their their mascot wasn't a bear; it was a white and brown burrow, you know, like donkey. Mm -hmm. Right. And before and before that, they were called the Hilltoppers, which was uh, because they play on Federal Hill in mm -hmm. Providence, which is the highest point in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, and because the science library for the university is on top of Federal Hill, the 14th floor of the science library is actually the highest point in the entire state because it's the highest point, the highest building on the highest point. Mm -hmm. and, um, and those 14 floors are color coded to the pH scale because it's a science library. So you can tell what floor you're on by what color the walls are. Yeah. So, you know, I, I remember when I, when I took my, my, uh, my tour of Brown when I was looking at, at the schools, our tour guide was, he was a real, real comic. And uh, he had, he, we went in the, you went in that hall with all the old pictures of the founders of the school. He said, if you pay enough money and grow a white beard, you can have your picture in this room too. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> and, and, then, and then there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a big stone outside of a building that said like 1802, which was you know, the founding of the building. Not a cornerstone, it was out in front, big boulder. And he goes, yeah, that's our geology department. They number all of our rocks. So, but, but those things weren't far off. I thought that a lot of the schools have really kind of goofy things that they're kind of proud of. Um, sure. You know, like at Cornell, when Cornell plays Harvard, they throw fish on the ice. I couldn't find out why. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, some of the ways that the schools have kind of teased each other, like Handsome Dan, the Yale mascot, has been uh, kidnapped by Harvard students repeatedly because they're, they have such a rivalry because Yale was founded by students who had left Harvard thinking that it wasn't strict enough and wasn't puritanical enough. Um, obviously, you know, now, Right, yeah, you know, I just saw it in the paper in the Times yesterday, New York Times yesterday, there's a call to rename Yale because Elihu Yale, you know, was a, he was the head of the East India Trading Company, which brought slaves right. to to, uh, to the colonies. So there's, you know, that would that that would be a, a major rebranding, obviously, because it's one of the oldest and most prominent schools in the world. Well, you bring up a, a point which we won't we won't focus too much on, which is is it's it's very different times now with regard to the student body and right. what they're coming away with. <laughs> the only issue, and I'll say this, and this may be politically incorrect, it costs a lot of money to go to these schools now, right? And yeah. um, what's interesting is that these types of issues are now at the forefront, and there should, I guess there's gonna be a negotiation with admin school administrators, but you know, I'm someone that, that isn't necessarily so keen on changing the history of a school so quickly, right? And I think that also um, it's not necessarily up to the current students who are there. It's also, it should also be weighed um, with the alumni as well of each right. school. Now that might be a conservative perspective. That's just how I see it. But anyway. Um, but I think, you know, to that point though, is looking at these particular schools, Mm -hmm. Harvard, Brown, and Yale, and Cornell were all named after, not necessarily their founders, but their biggest benefactors. Right. You know, yeah, so, I mean, right. you know, there's the, in Harvard Yards, there's the statue, it, it's supposed to be John Harvard, but it's called the Statue of the Three, the Three Lies, because it's not John Harvard, it's Samuel Hoare, who signed the Declaration of Independence for, for, for Massachusetts, he was a, a senator. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it said Harvard did not found the school, he just donated his personal library and got the school kind of going. 
Right. Uh, it, it, the, the first graduating class of Harvard was nine students. It wasn't a, the behemoth it is now mm. by any stretch. And also that there's a date on the, on the statue that is not the proper date for the founding of the school. So, um, <laughs> you know, you, I mean, just because I give a lot of books to a school, should they read it? You know, it's happening now. There was a college uh -huh. uh, in, uh, in New Jersey about 20 years ago that was renamed because uh, even at Penn, you know, someone just gave a large donation and the law school is being renamed in their honor. Uh -huh. Right. You know, is, is that the way things should be going? Should we be branding our schools to the highest bidder? You know, it, I think it's a much larger debate, but obviously, you know, with, uh, if, if the founders were not the uh, upstanding citizens we, that some uh, alumni like to think of them, and it, I think it deserves being looked at, but yeah, it, can't be a, it certainly can't be a snap decision. No, no, not at all. And um, just as a disclaimer, or um, I'm actually, I've, I've been a volunteer for Penn for over 20 years now. So um, yeah, me too. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of work with regard to change within the institution. But when it comes to this kind of renaming and uh, rebranding in this particular political environment, um, they have to do a lot of surveying of, 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 of different populations in the schools. But that's a, that's a whole other thing. Let's go back to you with regard to um, why you started or, or how you became a writer. Why is it, is it interesting to you? Those sorts of things. What, when did you know that you were going to become a writer? This was at school? At um, I mean, I, I, you know, my, my, uh, my mom had, had worked in, in uh, she, she had been in advertising and had edited a newspaper for uh, the National Park in Lowell, Massachusetts, where I grew up when I was a kid. Uh, you know, there was always books around. We were always, you know, just playing with words, writing. Uh, my mom and I liked to write song parodies together. So I'd always been kind of playing with words. And, but I think it was really, you know, I mean, to a great extent, it was at Penn, where just um, I was allowed, I, I just knew that I was, there weren't many TAs in the English department. You were meeting with eminent top professors. I mean, I, I had a class with uh, the former Dean, Rebecca Bushnell, with six other students. I mean, that's okay. like unheard of. Yeah, yeah, sure. So to have, to have that access and to have them get to know me as a person and as a writer, you know, I mean, really one of the most profound achievements of my life to this day was I, I did an honors thesis on Shakespeare. It was a two-year uh, project. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was the research and the, and the, the depth to which I got to uh, get in, engaged with members of the English department, right up to, you know, the department head, Al Phil Reese and Herman Beavers, who had been my, my, uh, my house parent when I moved in at Hill House. Mm -hmm. I'm still, you know, these people became my friends. I'm, I, they, they got some of the first copies of the book. Uh, I see them whenever I go down to Philadelphia. They call me when they, you know, that's kind of unheard of at any college these days to have that access. And it really inspired me. So my father and my grandfather had both been attorneys and very good attorneys. Mm -hmm. So I knew, I knew I had to kind of look down that road. So I, was, I became a paralegal at a huge firm in Boston. And it, I was enjoying it, but I knew it, I wasn't going to be as good as, it, as my father. My father mm -hmm. really just had a knack for it. And his father was like a legend in, in the legal community. He, had, um, he had, was valedictorian of his class and, and he had taught... Uh, law review to some of the biggest attorneys in town, including <laughs> F. Lee Bailey, who was one of yeah, we know F. Lee. attorneys. So. We know him. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So anyway, um, so I was a paralegal, but I was, I, I loved music. I always have. And I was going mm -hmm. out to concerts every night and writing reviews for, um, for, you know, the, the free magazines, the zines in Boston. And so unfortunately I'd be going out to one, one in the morning, coming home, showering, going to bed, getting up at five 30 and going into the law firm. And it wasn't gonna, it wasn't sustainable. So my father and I used to have Sunday brunch at a place, actually I was living near Harvard. So I was in the Porter Square, which is the next subway stop. I mean, Davis Square, the next subway stop out. Mm. And uh, it was a place called Johnny D's, which is no longer there, unfortunately. And we were having brunch and I said to my dad, okay, look, you've never pressured me, but if you want me to be a lawyer, tell me now <laughs> and I'll stop the writing. I just, I, I didn't know what else to do. I just, so I just put it in his hand. He had never really, you know, he'd never been one of those dads who like, you're going to be a lawyer and this, you know, it's, it's destiny, it's legacy. So, and, and he, I was all ready for him to say, you know, Matt, it's time, you know, enough of this writing and, and the being out all night. He said, no. And I looked at him like, you know, who are you? Who, it's like, a, who's stolen your body? You know, you, are you my father? And I said, what do you know? He goes, well, you can't come work for me because I'm in Lowell and there are no more clients. So you can't work for me. Like, 
I, he had worked with my grandfather. Oh, and he I said, see. you're going you're gonna to end up in one of these huge firms as an associate. He said, you know, you might make partner. I'm sure you would because you work so hard. But, you know, he said, are your, are your colleagues happy? I said, well, they make a lot of money. He said, that's not my question. He said, are they happy? I said, no, they're miserable. They drag themselves home at two in the morning every morning. Mm-hmm. They, don't get, they don't have any time with their family. So, you know, and I, he said, well, can you make it as a writer? If, if you do writing, can you make a living? I said, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll make it work. And he basically just said, go with my blessing. And it's, you know, it's been 25, 24 years. And it's been an amazing ride. I've inter- you know, traveled the world, been to, to your beautiful country, um, interviewed, well, your beautiful adopted country. Yeah, I um, love it, right? <laughs> yeah, met my heroes. I mean, I'm doing food bits on the, ra- on, on the radio now. So I'm getting to meet all these chefs and restaurateurs, which is fun. Um, I've done PR for record labels and schools. And I, I've been doing some writing for Harvard at School of Education, um, and, that, and now this book. So, you know, it's not the easiest life. A lot of people say, you know, my son is uh, thinking of going into journalism. My daughter's thinking of becoming a writer. What do you recommend? I said, have it be a hobby for the first couple of years. Right, it's not right, something right. to hang yeah. your hat on. But, you know, I've, I've been able to just have enough projects going on at the same time that I'm able to put a living together. And it's also allowed me to be home with, I have seven-year-old twins, so it allows me to work from home and be with them. Um, I'm, I'm an adjunct English professor at some smaller colleges around Boston. It's allowed me to keep in teaching and, and just hopefully share what I love about writing with, with other people and, and show them that writing can be a valid pursuit and, and that it is ne- still necessary. So, um, you know, it hasn't been the easiest road, but I've, I, the, the, cost, the benefits really outweigh the costs. And, you know, it's led me to meet people like you, have opportunities like this. And I talk to my friends from the law firm and they just say, you know, it's been 25 years. I'm st- I didn't make partner, and I'm still here from nine to ten every day. And I, you know, I we haven't had a vacation in three years. You know, what what's what's all the money good for at that point? So there it well, is. Well, I mean, you said a lot of things. I mean, were there expectations from your family, and and you had to? I mean, you said you went to get your father's blessing. Was this a formal? Uh, is this something that 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 is normally done in your family where at a certain age you have to say okay this I'm, is what I'm, i want to do i'm an only i'm an only child so i was kind of, i've been you know planning it as i go along but uh-huh. I, I just just like i said he had never pushed me and i did i just i wanted to know i just wanted to give him a chance you know i really thought that he deserved that because you know i had been going to his law office since i was a kid making you know necklaces mm-hmm. out of paper clips and using the you know copying my hand on the photocopy machine yeah, right, right, but yeah. you know uh, it was interesting work. I mean, I did see the value in it. Um, you know, as a paralegal, I wasn't really given much opportunity to really dig into any of the cases and find out what was going on. I was more doing editing and things like that, which was, you know, my strong suit, so it was fine. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I just, I just really just figured that um, had, had I just gone off on my own and then it didn't go the right way or to find out he really had wanted me and just didn't know how to say it, so I, I just wanted to be explicit, and it just it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. It, it, in fact, it, in my office, when Johnny D's closed, I I have in a frame the piece of flooring that our table was on that mm-hmm. day because such a prof- you know, it was a profound day. It literally, yeah. you know, directed my life. It was the two roads in the narrow wood, as it were, to quote Robert Frost. So um, you know, it's just it's it's a moment I'll never forget, and um, I'm I'm really grateful because uh, well, you know they, my parents always supported me. And, um, you know, but I've been able to do it on my own, never had to go hat in hand to them, ask for a loan or something. I just, uh, just keep on working, trying new things. And, and um, you know, uh, I've met enough good people who I can have trustworthy relationships with and, and, and published enough stuff that, yeah, I, I, can, I can make a living and also have all the other benefits that I mentioned. Right. Let me ask you a question. So what was it about this particular format? Or, I mean, you, you happen to see me, you're one of the first people that responded when I came up with this idea of doing online interviews. Now, I've been watching people on YouTube for a long, long time, right? I mean, I watch YouTube more than, I don't even watch TV anymore. I rarely go to the movies. I used to go to the movies, but let's say if if I'm on an airplane, that's when I'll catch up with movies, but now I can't fly, I mean, there's no, right, so for us or for right now in this moment, the internet is the place, in my opinion. Right. So you're one of the first people that saw me do this. Like what, what was it about 
um, what it was doing or what, what did you see specifically that made you want to contact me and uh, pitch? I mean, the thing, the thing that I really admired and that I, that I really appreciate is we seem to have a similarity in that, you know, I became a journalist because I love telling stories, but, you know, while it's been fun to interview celebrities and, and, you know, famous people who, 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 who writers who maybe have more awards than I have or more experience than I have have also interviewed makes you feel like, you know, I've kind of reached that new level. I've really enjoyed talking to the people who you might not know, kind of, you know, like the people in your neighborhood. Like I have a column now where I'm interviewing a, a, a military veterans who have businesses and I have a, uh, doing this, this, um, the food spots I do in WBZ. You know, I, I don't go after the chain restaurants. I go after, I, I really try to engage the mom and pop, you know, the woman who's making brownies in her basement. Or I met a guy who, uh, who decided to put pretzels and chocolate in peanut butter. And, and, you know, he was really literally doing it. Or another, another person I recently met, he grinds, he used to work for Pete's Coffee. He was with the corporate behemoth. Now he's mm -hmm. literally grinding coffee in his basement and delivering it bag at a time in a van, in a van with his, yeah. with his picture on the side. Yeah. And, you know, it's a great story. You know, you're like, you're asking me, why do I, why would you do that? You know, if you're working for Pete's and can just cruise along, no. and, you, know, get your, you know, why would you leave that to, to work so much? And he said the same thing, the relationships. He said, I yeah. know my customer. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's the key. In my opinion. Yeah. So, yeah no, I, well, that's, that's the thing. I totally agree. I mean, uh, I, I don't like, I'm not a big name dropper, but mm -hmm. when I go to a restaurant and, you know, the bar, the bartender, you know, like when I was first starting it, I knew that I wasn't a big enough name to get the celebrity chefs, you know, like uh -huh. the Bobby Flays, whatever. Right. So I would call and say, what's the name of your bartender? What's the name of your, of your, your hostess, your host? You know, what's the name of your, your head bus boy or whatever, head mm -hmm. buster? I'm sorry to be using the, the gender terms, I apologize. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. 20, 25 years ago. They were uh, different folks. But anyway, um, and, and they would pick up the phone and be like, why do you want to talk to me? I was like, you're a person, right? Yeah. Right. You have experiences, right? Yeah. You have stories to tell, right? I guess so. And it was fresh. And it, was, it wasn't a publicist sending me, these mm -hmm. are the questions you will ask and these are the answers you will be given. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I loved it. And then, you know, I would go to the restaurant that whenever I went and they would come by and say, hey, Matt, that was really cool. My, my mom loved it. And just, that's, you know, I didn't care if I got paid for the story at that point. That was just like, that's why I was doing it. Just the right. good feeling yeah, of, yeah, you know, yeah. everyone has a story. Everyone deserves, deserves attention. Right. And, and, and yeah. so that, that's really what, what I've loved to do as a writer. And that's what I really picked you up. Know, I mean, the interviews you do, they're, they're beautifully produced, but they're, they're, they're comfortable. We're having a conversation. Right. This, you don't have little blue cards, like, you know, a late night talk show host. We're just doing what we no, do. No, you just talk. And, and, the idea is we'll that we'll be right back after this message. Oh, sorry. no, 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 no! Like, I mean, you have to make it very um, relatable, right? Yeah. And I think the more that you have, you know, you're going after celebrities, it, it's not relatable. I mean, I as I explained to you, I worked uh, at the Charlie Rose show as a an intern, and then I oh, worked yeah. at um, as a guest booker for MSNBC Breaking News, and I started to book. The re not regular people, but people that weren't on their list, right? So let's say if the you know we had to get things very quickly, I said, well, I know this other person who's a, who's a better like a better would be fit would be a better fit. Now they weren't on the list; it was an unofficial list, right? But once I started getting these people in one by one, that I think the the ratings started to change. Now they didn't tell oh, sure. me. Yeah, I mean, they didn't you know, tell me. go, they didn't tell go me. on the major news networks when there's any sort of crisis, and it's the same, you know, Anthony Fauci, God love him, you know, he's amazing, <laughs> but, you know, where, where, is, where is his deputy? Where is right, his right, wife? Where right. is his children? Right, look, I'm, I'm there with you. And it, or you just don't put on Anthony Fauci just because everybody else puts on Anthony Fauci. If there is a pandemic, right, or if there's some big thing. Let's just assume there's one. <laughs> you know, then you need to go, being you, the people need to go and find every expert. Now, this is back in the day when the news was not political, right? Every expert that could give us an angle around what is happening, not just that guy, right? right. Since he's the right. top guy. I don't care if he's the top guy, right? Because I know, just based on experience, that there's somebody else that is a competitor of his 
right. that would have an equal, if not greater, you know, uh, point of view or, or knowledge to the situation. Right. Currently, we're not in that in that in that. Uh, well, we're not I mean, living in that again, era. Go, going back to our, you know, my my friends and neighbors at Harvard, you know, yes. in, on the local news, we're seeing the head of Harvard Medical School a lot. Mm -hmm. But he's not in with the patients. He's in his office. Yeah, yes, he's getting the reports and, and the charts and all that stuff. But, you know, I'd rather hear from, you know, from the nurse and the EMT who took this person gasping for air out of his house and brought him to the emergency room. That's, yeah. that's where you're going to get what's happening to people. Yeah, but, it's not going to be you, You're right on point. You're right on point. I mean, like, I, I'll tell you a quick story, and then we go back to a couple more questions about your book. I, okay. When I worked as a booker, we had to get... This, this is the scenario they put out. They said, we want a family that is equally divided between Republicans and Democrats. And we want the person to be interviewed, not to, to be, uh, how do you say, it? not independent, but uncommitted. So this is during the Bush and Gore, uh, right. right before. So I was like, how am I going to find that particular person? I don't know. So I had done clinical trials. I was a you know, someone that that uh, participated in clinical trials at Penn, my last semester. That's how I graduated. And uh, the nurses were so amazing there, right? And they just seemed to know a lot. I said, you know what? The nurses probably will know. So I called Michigan because that Michigan was a split, uh, uh, what do you call it? A um, swing state. Yeah. Swing state. And so that's where they wanted the person to come. So I dialed every hospital. Well, I made a list of hospitals. I dialed the first hospital, asked to speak to the nurses, and got the guests right there on the spot. And that was only because I, of my experience sitting in the, you know, in the, in that in that um, clinical trial, and right. observing how nurses, you know, tick. Like they and 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 that's how I've been. That's how I booked the shows. That's how I'm right. doing this interview with you now. As soon as you contacted me, I'm like, oh, he's on. <laughs> he's on it's just a done deal right now we had to negotiate back and forth right it was a back and forth for like a couple of weeks oh, sure. but i was like oh no he's on right because i know if he self-published a book then he you know the, the the content and what he's interested in it, there's a story behind it yeah right? oh yeah so uh what else can you tell us and you know we've been we've, we've been going long is there anything else that you can tell us about the book um that people should know and in the of course where they can get the book now what if right. we sell all 50 books you have 50 books right now on you um yeah yeah i mean i, I ordered so, a, i ordered a, a second a second lot you know so now i i, I have i literally at, at my right hand i have a box of about 70. all right so look I, this is what we're going to do e email me at matt at lions tigers bulldogs.com i'll personalize it for you send it out myself uh, we got little coloring pages. You'll sign it, right? Cool. You'll sign it like you'll oh, sign Oh, yeah, it. I love it. Okay, so 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 he has 50 books. Let's see if we can get people to, you know, buy the 50 books. We're going to put in the description box um, the website, right? Because then yeah. they can go directly well, if you to want, if you want to, If you want to personalize, you have to email me. It's matt at lionstigersbulldogs.com. Okay, and then, okay. Yeah, so and it, I'll, I'll, I'll get them up. I, I think it's amazing. And this, and this is another thing I'm excited about. Because what we are focusing on, just so you guys know, are creators and creatives, people like, you know, people who are artists and writers and thought leaders, small business owners, entrepreneurs, right? This, this group of people, inventors. Um, and so let's see what happens, right? Let's see if we can sell sure. the 50 books yep. just yeah, by that's, virtue that's... of us creating this conversation and putting it out there. So when we're finished, yeah. and I will upload it tonight or today, um, then, you know, Let's see what we can do. So let's see what if yep. we can make it happen. And and also, if anybody who's watching this video is interested in contacting me with stories similar to Matt's, feel free to contact me. You can, I, I think the information, you, you can make a comment, write a comment in the video. I, I will respond. And I'll yeah, let you have the last. He's very, he's very good. He's a very good communicator. Well, I'll, I'll let you have the last word. Is there anything else that we should know about the book? Um, well, the, the question I get the most is, you know, who is it for? You know, because it's, it's, it's mostly illustrated. It's kind of looks comic booky. So people say, you know, is it a children's book? Is it an adult mm -hmm. book? Um, it, it started out as kind of a children's book, like, you know, the ABCs of the Ivy League type thing. Mm -hmm. But um, 
it's really kind of, I mean, my, I've had grandparents, I had one woman who bought it for her father, who mm -hmm. had, was at his, like, his, going to his 60th Dartmouth reunion, and had been on the crew team, and had won all these medals, and he loved it, and then her granddaughter look, was looking at it, and she loved it, so, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, my, my daughters love it, my, my seven-year-old, I made little stickers, actually, on the front that says, it's great, Shira Robinson, age seven. You know, it's just, I mean, what better publicity can you get than, a, yeah. than your, your, your daughter being backing it up? Um, so, it, you know, I really hope that there's something for everybody. It was a lot of fun to write. Um, I'm, I'm putting more trivia uh, on, on my website pretty regularly. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'm, I'm going to go down to Penn. Uh, if homecoming happens, I'm supposed to go down and present the book down there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, for, it's, it's for sale at a couple hotels and stores like in New Haven and in Ithaca and in Hanover. So, you know, um, it, it just, it's, and, but the most, the greatest thing about it, obviously, you know, honoring my father, but the people I've met uh, after, you know, after it was out, I mean, meeting Jim Rolden, my illustrator, he's been terrific. Uh, we're thinking of doing something else together, but the people like you and all the alumni and friends that I've met uh, who have expressed interest and, try, and supported me. And I've obviously used, trying to use my writing and communication skills to try to support them. So if anyone needs that, they can email me too. Um, but yeah, it's really just been an amazing new community that I knew was there, but like I said, I kept putting off and I'm really glad that, that, I, uh, that, I, that, I, that I jumped in and I'm very grateful. Okay, well, well said, thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you and hearing your Likewise. story and, and, and you. getting a little bit more right than what we were talking about in emails and stuff. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, look, we'll 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 put it up and see what happens. Okay, that's all. all we, right. That's you know that that's a freelancer's career. Put it up and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to that. Yeah, yeah, we'll see what happens, right? All right, all right. Matt, take care of yourself. Tigersbulldogs.com. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye you. Well. we'll talk to you soon, eh? Okay. Be well. Bye bye. Stay well, everybody.